Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present a short lecture on the gross pathology of the pancreas. We'll focus mostly on the exocrine or digestive part of the pancreas because the endocrine part has already been covered in lectures on endocrine pathology and islets are really small and most lesions affecting islets with the exception of a couple that I will mention in this lecture don't cause any significant gross lesions. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me images, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's look at the pancreas of a dog. Now, first blush, you would think that this is a red, angry-looking pancreas. But the pancreas is replete with a lot of digestive enzymes and soon begins to break down after death. And so in certain species, especially dogs and horses, this is what you usually see even fairly soon after the animal's death. There will be hemorrhage and edema. The pancreas will often turn sort of reddish and become spongy feeling. Don't interpret a red pancreas as sign of pancreatitis. We'll get to that in just a minute. Something that you'll all also see in older dogs and cats and other species, including ferrets, are these white nodules of hyperplasia of the exocrine tissue. They tend to be firmer than the surrounding tissue. They're white because we've crammed a lot of extra cells into the same spot. And this is an incidental finding which increases with age and should not be considered to be part of any pathologic process. They stand out really nicely in this somewhat autolytic pancreas. These areas of hemorrhage in autolytic pancreases are very common. And in just a sec, we're going to look at what necrotizing pancreatitis looks like in the dog. I also want to show you the pancreas of a cat. Cats and ferrets probably have the most uh, foci of exocrine or acinar hyperplasia as they get older within the pancreas. Okay, a couple of other things that you see in this particular cat, another incidental finding associated with age, are these areas of blood accumulation within the liver that's called telangiectasis or telangiectasia, seen in cats and cattle. Okay, so let's take a look at this particular uh, pancreas. This is also from a dog. You can see areas of hemorrhage and a somewhat reddish cast to it, which may be autolytic. But the key that this animal has acute pancreatic necrosis are these white flakes of saponified or mineralized fat to make a diagnosis grossly of acute pancreatic necrosis. A history is nice, but you have to see the saponified fat. This tells you that this process was going on anti-mortem. There was damage to the pancreas, liberation of digestive enzymes, including trypsin and lipase. And you can see fat necrosis within the fat in the interlobular spaces and occasionally within the surrounding mesentery. Now, cats, on the other hand, tend to have much less hemorrhage and more fat necrosis than dogs. And a lot of the pancreatitis that we see in cats results from ascending infections. The causes of pancreatitis in dogs are, are many, and you often never get to the true cause. It may result um, as a result of obstruction or ascending infection through the ducts. Uh, or direct damage to acinar cells due to physical trauma, especially surgical trauma, uh, hypoxia, uh, reperfusion damage is extremely important in pancreatitis. So animals that become hypovolemic may have damages when proper perfusion of this organ is restored. There are a number of of uh, toxins such as zinc, which are directly damaging to acinar cells and will cause destruction and liberation of these packaged enzymes. And a drug that is well linked to uh, 
uh, to pancreatitis in the dog is steroids. So it could be iatrogenic, could be secondary to uh, hypercortisolemia as well. Now, of all of the enzymes that's released during acute pancreatitis, trypsin is probably the most damaging because not only will it damage adjacent to uh, astronaut cells, but it also activates a number of other enzymes within the pancreas, including elastase and phospholipase and precalicrin. Um, the pancreas normally has a lot of trypsin inhibitors, but a significant injury will result in the elaboration of enzymes, tying up all those trypsin inhibitors, and any more that is released will cause direct damage. The activation of precalicrin may lead to DIC, thrombosis, hypoxia, and additional damage. Many animals have uh, several different episodes of uh, pancreatitis. So in animals with a recurrent pancreatitis, you may see a combination of fibrosis and areas of acute inflammation. Here's some fibrin deposition and uh, hemorrhage on the outside of the adjacent uh, intestine. Another change that is more often seen in species other than dogs is known as chronic interstitial pancreatitis. This is the most common uh, form of pancreatitis in cats and horses. It often results from an inflammatory uh, insult to the ducts, which arises from the ducts, and you get extensive fibrosis throughout the interlobular and intralobular septa, resulting in this profound lobularity, and over time the entire organ will be reduced in size. The reduction in size is usually due to the fibrosis, contraction of that fibrous connective tissue, and loss of asinine. And if you look carefully, the, uh, the eyelets are usually pretty well preserved. So you'll see this, this characteristic pattern, the absence of hemorrhage. You wanna think about chronic interstitial pancreatitis. Here's a classic disease in dogs that for many years was incorrectly called pancreatic hypoplasia because it was so often seen in very young dogs. But it's not pancreatic hypoplasia. It's an early onset autoimmune mediated disease, which is now called canine juvenile pancreatic atrophy. It's most commonly seen in German shepherds and collies, chows, and English setters and beagles are all, uh, all breeds that have been affected uh, by this. It's a complex genetic disorder. Early reports said it was autosomal recessive, but actually in these different breeds, um, the age of onset and the severity of the disease is very different. So it's thought to be a little more complex than a simple autosomal recessive. It actually will start in neonatal English setters, but in beagles, it usually appears several months down the road. And it's often precipitated in these animals by some pre-existent GI disease or a change in the normal household diet or environment. If you catch it at the right time in these very young animals, you will see intense infiltration of the pancreas by lymphocytes, especially cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. There can be a smattering of other inflammatory cells, including uh, eosinophils and plasma cells in the most intense areas of inflammation. And these lymphocytes are seen with between and even within acinar and ductal epithelium. Unlike er, other early onset uh, autoimmune diseases in the dog, such as uh, immune-mediated thyroiditis, there is no evidence that this is precipitated by autoantibodies against pass, uh, pancreatic acini or ductal epithelium. And 
one of the characteristic diseases which caused early confusion about hypoplasia versus uh, atrophy is that reactive fibroplasia is not part of this condition. There's almost no fibrous connective tissue put down as opposed to uh, relapsing or recurrent pancreatitis of traditional uh, insults. Here's another picture. Most of these animals have very little fat left. They have these big, bulky stools. You may see a lipofusinosis of uh, the intestine or a brownish discoloration. And usually there's very little left of the pancreas except some ducts and, and some well-preserved eyelet tissue. Um, by the time that the clinical signs of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, those big bulky uh, voluminous stools with a lot of fat and uh, uh, within them um, appears. And you have to lose about 90% of your pancreas before the clinical signs appear. Um, the islets are usually normal in these animals, but there have been uh, uh, cases, especially in greyhounds and rarely in German shepherds, in which both acinar and islet tissue is affected. On the ClinPath side, at this time, you will see a decreased trypsin-like immunoreactivity, decreased cobalamin, and increased folate levels in the blood. Okay, here's pancreas from an ox, and cattle are probably the ones that are most common to be affected with pancreatic calculi. These calculi are small, they're hard, they arise within the ducts, and they're most commonly um, composed of phosphates or carbonates complexed with uh, calcium or magnesium. They're usually incidental findings. They may be associated with the inflammatory disease or the presence of flukes, which we'll talk about just in just a minute, um, which may be seen in a number of different species, but most commonly in ruminants. Usually they're seen in older animals and they're extremely rare in, uh, in other species other than cattle. Cattle over four or five years of age team set, seem to be the most commonly affected. So uh, sort of cool but unusual finding, pancreatoliths. On a parasite basis, um, one of the causes of pancreatoliths and a cause of, of uh, pancreatic disease, especially in ruminants, are uh, flukes. Flukes generally belong to the genus Eurotrema. There are a number of them that will affect ruminants. Also, pigs and raccoons have their own uh, Eurotrema procyonis. Um, being a dicrociliate fluke, they do have a, 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 a life cycle in which they go through snails and grasshoppers may act as intermediate hosts um, for some of the species as well. They tend to migrate and get both into the bile ducts and the pancreatic ducts. They don't have a good sense of direction, but they're considered a parasite of the pancreatic duct, and affected ducts may become greatly dilated in this one. You may have inflammatory disease, especially if these animals or these parasites die within the uh, pancreatic ducts. They result in granulomatous disease. The inflammatory disease may cause this fibrosing lobular change, which we already talked about as chronic interstitial pancreatitis, and which is often associated with ductal inflammation. Heavy infections in certain species, such as sheep and rarely in cats, may result in progressive ill thrift, weight loss, and even death. Okay, I mentioned that we wouldn't talk much about the uh, endocrine pancreas. We've already covered that. but And there's very few lesions that actually show up when you talk about the endocrine pancreas, at least on a gross basis. And this is the pancreas of a rhesus monkey. And all of these white areas, you might look at it and you say, well, that's fat necrosis. Okay. You may say, hey, those are areas of hyperplasia. And this was a cat which also gets this lesion. Um, 
I could probably uh, uh, discuss that as well. But what we're looking at is all of the islets, and the islets are very prominent because they have been largely effaced by the deposition of islet amyloid. This is often seen in uh, obese macaques and those with impaired glucose tolerance. And uh, islet polypeptide will kill off islets and result in diabetes in a number of ways, uh, including one just crowding out and compressing the islet cells, especially the beta cells, which produce insulin, and physically resulting in loss of functioning beta cells. But the polypeptide itself, islet amyloid polypeptide, also known as amylin, is its production is toxic to beta cells. We see this in rhesus monkeys with diabetes. We see this commonly in older cats as well. Now you wonder why would the body produce uh, islet amyloid polypeptide, which is actually toxic. And it does have some functional uses. Um, it is thought to uh, slow the rate of glucose building up in the plasma by causing a reduction in food intake, slowing gastric emptying, and inhibiting secretion of gastric acid pancreatic enzymes in bile. So it sort of runs counter to the production of insulin, but because it's destructive to the islets, it really, over the lifetime, runs counter to uh, the effects of insulin. It's not a lesion that you pick up very often. You need to have a history that the animal is obese, at least, it, or diabetic in the rhesus monkeys, and you may be very lucky and see it in very old felines as well. Okay, we've already looked at, at the most common, by far, proliferative lesion of the pancreas at the beginning of this lecture, and that are areas of exocrine hyperplasia or asner hyperplasia. They're small. They're multifocal. They look like little round BBs of whitish tissue, and they're firmer than the surrounding tissue. Now, one of the more uncommon lesions um, that is rarely seen. Sometimes in older dogs, cats, and cattle are pancreatic exocrine adenomas. And the question is, are these really adenomas or are these really just big hyperplastic nodules? Grossly, they tend to resemble normal acinar tissue more than the hyperplastic nodules. They're sort of multilobular and they are a very good size here. You can see this one is almost a centimeter or, or actually more than a centimeter in diameter. Um, they're not infiltrative. They do not explant or spread around the pancreas and they are generally focal. You generally see one. They may arise either from duct epithelium, which is actually more common, and when you get that under the microscope, you can tell that pretty quickly, or they may arise from asner tissue, but they are uncommon lesions, at least in domestic species. And uh, it probably is not likely you may ever run into them. Something that you will likely run into if you deal with a lot of older cats, especially, but dogs will get them too, are pancreatic exocrine carcinomas. Um, these are carcinomas. They're multifocal within the pancreas. Sometimes you'll see some rather large lobules such as this. They often have some hemorrhage around them. They may be mineralized, and they result in adhesions to other tissues, um, uh, clumping up of the mesentery. These metastasize very quickly. They also tend to explant along the omentum and the mesentery, especially in cats. They will be a cause of carcinomatosis, as when they explant, they stimulate the formation of fibrous connective tissue, which eventually is going to contract. And you may see small beads of the tumor throughout the abdomen and a big clump of intestine around them. They do tend to carry a very grave prognosis in domestic species as they do in people, uh, 
We're doing a, really a lot of good with pancreatic carcinoma in people. It has risen um, up to, I think, number two um, for causes of cancer deaths in the U.S. Probably has something to do with our diet. But we've done so well with a lot of the other cancers that we're still working on it. But I remember a time when uh, a diagnosis of pancreatic carcinoma um, usually resulted in death in about six years, and now people are living five, six years, even longer with this uh, neoplasm. So, But it is not a good one to have if you're a person or if you're a dog or cat or any other species. Another neoplasm that's extremely common and one of my favorite species, the ferret, but you'll see in dogs and cats, is an islet cell tumor, or rarely one of the other uh, neoplasms of the islets of Langerhans. You can see gastrinomas, which secrete gastrin, can cause a, a stomach ulceration. But islet cell tumors are uh, by far the most common neoplasm of the islets. They're a little different. If you look at this versus you look at those exocrine tumors, note the color. Um, Tumors of the islets tend to be reddish pink because they're heavily vascularized. Remember that tumors tend to recapitulate the, uh, the tissues they come from, and islets are heavily vascularized. They, they produce hormones which have to circulate around the body, so they need that, uh, uh, they need that extra vasculature. Um, islet cell tumors tend to be... Uh, they tend to be focal. You usually have one instead of uh, multiple whitish nodules in areas of hyperplasia or uh, in pancreatic carcinomas, which are often multifocal. So they're often one. And they're usually associated with clinical signs of hyperglycemia, which may be neurologic. Um, and unfortunately, in dogs and cats, they metastasize very widely, uh, often before clinical signs are noticed. In ferrets, they don't. A ferret is not a cat, nor is it a dog, and they will develop insulinomas, get all the clinical signs, but uh, they can be surgically excised. So islet cell tumors tend to be focal. They're heavily vascularized in reddish pink, whereas tumors or hyperplastic lesions of the exocrine pancreas tend to be whitish and look much more like the surrounding tissue. And finally, metastatic lesions to the pancreas. Uh, this is a hemangiosarcoma in a dog. You can also see nodules in the adjacent mesentery and uh, the serosa of the duodenum. Uh, the, the pancreas is not a tremendous spot for metastasis, probably most common uh, to see lymphoma uh, in a variety of animal species, hemangiosarcoma, not too uncommon in the dog, but not a big site for metastatic tumors. Well, that was quick, a little over 20 minutes on, on the gross pathology of the pancreas. I hope you enjoyed that, and we are going to finish all of the lectures on the gross pathology of the GI system, which has included the GI tube, the liver, the pancreas, with one more lecture, a short lecture, on pathology of the mesentery. So I hope that you look for that one. Uh, thank you for coming to the Foundation's YouTube channel or website. And uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic day.